All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to lesson 27 uh, for the semester. And this, this lesson is entitled Vector Fields. Um, I have a few things to talk about before we start today's lesson, though. Um, the first of which is a reminder that we have our third midterm exam on Monday, which will be over all the topics we learned related to uh, double and triple uh, integration. So all of that will be uh, examined on uh, this coming Monday. So in preparation for that, uh, I'm going to post a uh, review video where I work through all the problems in the spring of 2018 exam. I'll be putting that up later this afternoon because I, I managed to get through the first half of the exam, but not the second half yet. So um, I'll be posting that spliced video uh, later today so you guys can take a look at that. Uh, and then on Monday, we'll be reviewing for the exam. So feel free to bring any questions that you guys have from any of the practice exams or just any question you can find. Um, feel free to bring that to class. There's Mike static. Uh oh. All right, how about now? Is that better? Is that good? All right, wonderful. All right, the other announcement uh, is not really an announcement about uh, class, more just an announcement about uh, mathematics in general. Uh, so, what's going on now? So, we finished the integration section, right? And in, throughout the semester, I've been making a big deal about how this class is essentially just Calc 1 in 3D. So we've done limits and kind of a review of like the basics or the basics of geometry in 3D. We did derivatives, which are now called partial derivatives. We did integrals, which are now multiple integrals. So what do we have left? I feel like we're pretty close to the end of Calc 1 if we did integrals already. There was one more thing we did in Calc 1 though that you could say was rather fundamental to our understanding of, of calculus. Does anyone remember what that is? Um, uh, well, that, that's what we're going to talk about today here, but uh, yeah, that's, not, that's not what we did in Calc 1. Um, what do we do in Calc 1? Hey, you guys really, I, I, I gave you a hint in, in me describing it. Yeah, the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's right. Yeah, it's quite fundamental to our understanding of, of calculus because it's how we do integrals most of the time. Whenever we do an integral, like let's say we do the integral of f prime of x uh, dx right here, it's going to be f of x plus c. So what we do is we find the antiderivative of the function inside the integral, and then that gives us uh, the result of our integral. So every time we integrate, we're effectively using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the fundamental theorem of calculus is effectively how uh, explains how integrals and derivatives are, are more or less opposites of one another. They're inverse operations of one another to, to a certain extent. And what we're going to be doing this uh, in this section is we're going to cover the higher dimensional versions of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So it turns out that they have versions of this that also exist for double and triple integrals, as well as partial derivatives as well. So we're going to be learning about that uh, in the final part of the semester, kind of like how we talked about the fundamental theorem of calculus in the final part of calculus one. Now, um, but in order to understand these new fundamental theorems of calculus, so their, their versions in higher dimensions, uh, we first need to cover something called a, a vector field. This is gonna be kind of a tool for analyzing these higher dimensional versions of the uh, FTC. All right, so what is a vector field? Well, for those of you who have taken physics, um, you probably already seen something like this before, especially if you've taken uh, electricity and magnetism, that variety of physics. So a vector field on say R2 is a function F that assigns a vector to each point X, Y in D, where D is a domain. So the vector field is written like this. We have F of X, Y, and then we have our function that depends on X and Y for the first coordinate here. And then we have our function for the second coordinate right here. So effectively what we're doing is we're taking every single point in space and assigning it a vector. Now in the same way, um, we could also define a vector field over R3 where each point X, Y, and Z is given a three direction or a, a three dimensional vector here, P, Q, and R, all of which can depend on X, Y, and Z right here. And by the way, we say the vector field is continuous or differentiable so long as its component functions. So P and Q here and P, Q and R here are continuous or differentiable, depending on which one 
uh, you're talking about here. Um, so what is a vector field intuitively? Uh, well, for those of you who have taken electricity and magnetism, you may be familiar with what's called an electric field. And an electric field, you have, you place a charge in it, it's going to move in a particular direction based on the vectors in your electric field. So an electric field is an example of a vector field. You also have the field of gravitational potential, which is very similar, uh, where if you um, place an object somewhere, then it'll move via gravitation uh, to a different place. That can also be a vector field. Um, now, one thing we're also going to be talking about is called a scalar field. So what a scalar field is, this is actually just, uh, you could almost imagine it as like a normal function, a normal multivariable function that we've been dealing with already. So what this does is we take in the coordinates x, y, and z right here, and then we spit out a number depending on the formula. So these are the functions that we're kind of used to dealing with in three dimensions. Uh, now we're dealing with ones that are a bit more complicated. We take all three of our variables and then we get three components with it. So effectively we're taking a point from three dimensional space and we're making another, you can imagine it as a point if you want, uh, in three dimensional space right here. And this, this can also be imagined as a vector field. All right, this is all very abstract. Let's, let's look at some pictures here. Maybe that'll help. Uh, plot the vector fields for the following vector functions right here. So our first vector field that we're looking at, and by the way, since it is a vector, we do put the arrow uh, over the vector field here. Um, so we have f of x, y is one zero. So what does this mean? It means that since we don't have any x's or y's in here, it seems like the vector that we're assigning to every point is the vector one zero, no matter what x and y are. So what, what, what is going on here? So we have one zero at the point zero zero, it's going like this. We have one zero at the point zero one. We have one zero at the point um, one zero. And we could just keep drawing this vector one zero at every point in the plane. And even though I'm kind of drawing it at seemingly specific points right here, this vector is really assigned to every single point in between as well. So at every point, we're assigning it the vector one zero. So what does this vector field look like? It just looks like a bunch of arrows all the same length. I'm intending to draw these all the same length. And it's pointing in the direction one zero right here. All right, so that's what this looks like. Uh, let's take a look at, and this, this is called a constant vector field, as you might imagine. So this is gonna assign the same vector everywhere. And while this is a very simple vector field, it's gonna be relatively boring compared to some of the ones we're looking at soon. All right, let's take a look at this next one here. We have a vector field f of x, y is x in, uh, in the x direction and y in the y direction. All right, well, what does that mean here? Well, let's plug in some points and find out. So let's say we wanna find out what vector we're assigning to the origin. So if we plug in zero for X and zero for Y, that's just gonna give us the zero vector at the origin. So we really can't even draw that. I guess we're just gonna symbolize that as a dot because it doesn't have any magnitude. It doesn't have a specific direction either. All right, how about one zero? What's that going to be? Well, if we plug this into the formula, we have one for the X coordinate and zero for the Y coordinate. So if we go to one zero, our vector is gonna look like this. All right, how about if we go to zero one? Well, whatever we have for X is gonna go here, and whatever we have for Y will be the Y component. So we have zero one right here. So that's what this vector is gonna look like. And as you can imagine, if we look in the negative directions as well, then we'll just get vectors pointing that way. And then zero, negative one will look like this. Okay, now what if I plug in something a little bit different than just all these? How about I plug in the point, uh, I don't know, maybe like two, one or something. Well, then according to the formula here, we have the vector two, one at the point two, one. So the point two, one, one, two, and then one, maybe that's right here. 
we're going to have a longer vector pointing out this way because the magnitude of this vector is root five, but the magnitude of these vectors are only one. So this vector is gonna be at least twice as long as the vectors we've seen already. And it's pointing in this direction right here. So pretty much this vector field, what it does is whatever direction you go in and however far out you go, that's going to be what your vector looks like. So if we go to the two versions of all of these, we're gonna have vectors pointing in that direction, but being two in length here. So it almost seems like with this, it almost seems like an explosion. So there's the, the origin right here. And then the further we get away from the origin, the more it's radiating outwards or uh, diverging. How do I determine the direction from the last vector there? Uh, with two, one. So I go two in this direction and then one up right here. So that's how I determine uh, the direction of this vector right here. All right. Are all vectors on the same circle, the same magnitude? That's right, because they're all the same distance um, from the origin right here. So yes, absolutely. All right. And then so, so this vector field is kind of radiating out. Uh, or another way of saying it is it's diverging from the origin. We'll be seeing this word diverging uh, in the near future. It's not the same thing as a series diverging. So we're not, we're not gonna go into that, but, it, but it, it does have something to do with this word diverging. All right, let's take a look at this next one here. This one looks a little bit more complicated. So we have negative y i hat plus x j hat, and then both of those are uh, uh, divided by x squared plus y squared under a square root here. All right, well, let's plot a few points and see what this one's gonna look like. All right, let's do zero, zero. Um, well, actually, wait a minute. This isn't even defined for zero, zero because we would be uh, dividing by zero here. So we're actually not going to have a vector uh, right here at the origin, so we can't draw one. here. Uh, let's see, one zero, well, we can have that. Uh, let's see, our y is zero, so we're gonna have zero in the y direction. And then if I plug one into here, I have one over one squared plus zero squared is one. So when I plug in the point one zero, I end up getting zero one as my point, or as my vector. Well, that's going to look like this. How about if we flip it around? Do one or flip it around. Do one zero zero one. There we go. Okay, this time we have negative y, so that's negative one, and then we have zero for x. So if we go to the point zero one, our vector is pointing in the direction negative one zero. That's like this. Okay, how about if we go to negative one zero? What's that going? Well, if we plug a negative one in for the X right here, um, we're gonna have negative one here. And then if we, point, uh, if we put in zero for Y, we're gonna have zero. What was I saying about divergence? I was saying that it seems like all of these back here are diverging away from the origin. And the further that they get away, the more they want to get away. All right, and then if, as you can probably guess from this pattern, uh, what are we gonna get for zero negative one? This one is going to give us one zero. Use the formula. Now, the interesting thing about this vector, uh, what type of vector is this right here? This vector has a special name right here. That's right, this is a unit vector. That's right, the magnitude of this is going to be one. The magnitude of this is one. So that means that unlike the previous one where we went out further and then the vectors got bigger, no matter which X or Y we input into here, the vectors will stay the same size. So let's say we went out to two zero instead. What's the one for two zero? Let me extend this chart a little more x, y, f. So let's say I go to two zero, that's a little bit further out. 
Uh, but let's see, I still have zero for the X component because it's negative Y. And then I plug X into here. I have two up here, but then I have the square root of two squared plus zero, which is also two. So I end up getting one. So I think I, um, I saw some people uh, asking, how do I know which direction the vector is going in? What I do is I go to this point in the plane. So I'm gonna go to two zero, which is right here. Then starting from there, I'm going to draw this vector. I'm gonna almost like pretend like this is the origin and draw this vector right here. So I go zero in the X direction and my arrow goes up one in the Y direction. So that's going to be my vector at two zero. And you can also do this for all the other two versions of the points I've already gotten. And we end up getting something like this. And if we go to one of the intermediate points, it's going to go diagonally in this direction. So all of these are unit vectors, by the way, all of these are the same length. So what's going on here? So it almost seems like the vectors are curling around the origin. And kind of like divergence, uh, curl is another word that we're gonna be coming back to later. So I think it's good that you remember this example of a vector field right here. All right, anyway, so there's some examples of vector fields. Those are kind of the visual ones where we drew them out. Um, so what are we going to do with these? What does this have to do with derivatives or integrals of the fundamental theorem of calculus like I promised here? Well, one special type of vector field that we're really going to be looking at a lot are called gradient fields. Now, remember, if you take the gradient of a function, you end up getting a vector, right? The gradient represents the direction of fastest change of a function. So if you take the gradient of a function, you get a vector. So what you could do is you could take the gradient at every single point on the plane and assign it, or if you could take every single point on the plane and assign it the vector, that's the gradient there. And that will be called a gradient field or a conservative vector field. This is usually the name uh, given to it. Okay, conservative, that's, that's kind of interesting. Why do we have the name conservative? And I'll talk about that in a moment. As the name implies, the field is generated by taking the gradient of a scalar valued function and we'll just see what that is. Okay, so a vector field F is called conservative if there is a differentiable function F and this function spits out only one number. So this is one of the more familiar types of multivariable functions here. Uh, the, the function f is called the potential function for f. So conservative, potential. Does anyone in physics know what those words have to do with? Energy, that's right. Oh, it looks like we had trouble with the mic. Okay, there we go. That's going to be better. All right. So this, the stuff that we're learning about has a lot to do with energy, in particular potential energy and conservation of energy. So that's kind of, if you want to have an intuition in terms of physics, that's the direction that we're going. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're trying to find a function f, so f of x, y in this case, where we take the gradient of f, and the gradient ends up being this vector field here. All right, so let's see if we can find a function whose x derivative is just x and whose y derivative is just y. So our goal here for finding the potential function for this right here is uh, we want to have partial f partial x equal x, and we have partial f partial y equaling y. So I'll let you guys think about this for a minute. What type of function would have an x derivative of x and a y derivative of y right here? Oh, it looks like, all right, so it looks like uh, Lewis has a good answer here. It's gonna be x squared over two plus y squared over two. 
Okay, and why does this work? Well, if we look at the gradient of F, let's see, we do the X derivative of this, the X derivative of this will be zero, and the X derivative of this, we bring the two down and it will cancel, and I'll give us X. And then we do the same thing with the Y derivative right here. So we do the Y derivative of this, we bring the two down, we just have Y, the twos will cancel and give us this Y. And then the Y derivative of that will be zero. So this is the potential function of this conservative vector field right here. Okay, so that's an example. Now this one, we kind of stared at it until we figured out um, what the potential is. There, don't worry, there will end up being, um, there's, there's gonna be a more reliable way of finding the, uh, the potential function in the future. Uh, what about a constant? Yeah, that's right. So we could have added any constant we wanted to uh, to this potential right here, and it still would have been the potential for this conservative vector field. So the thing is, kind of like how we, when we integrate, we have to add a plus C, with potentials, we can have infinitely many, and they just are shifted by a number right here. But if they ask for a potential function, then you could just give the one where C is zero or, or whichever one is most uh, convenient right here. All right. Let's, let's move on here. So suppose that F of X, Y, Z is the negative of some constant times the vector R over the magnitude of R cubed, where R is X, Y, and Z. So this R right here in physics, this would be called a position vector because it just gives the X, Y, and Z coordinates here. And any force that looks like this is said to follow what's called an inverse square law. And why is that? This looks like a cube here, not a square. How do we get that? Well, we can write any vector R as the magnitude of R times R hat. So when we write it like this, this and that cancel out, and we have a, a vector whose magnitude is a multiple of the reciprocal of R squared right here. So this is why it's called an inverse square law, because we can write it down like that. All right, so for example, uh, the gravitational force follows this inverse square law business, and so does the, uh, I, I think it's called the Coulomb force. Oh man, it's been too long since I've done electricity and magnetism. Um, the one for just electrostatic movement is also going to be uh, an inverse square law here. Uh, but don't worry too much about the physics if you haven't seen it. I'm just explaining this for the edification of people who've taken physics. All right, so let's go ahead. What we wanna do is we wanna show that this function right here, c over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, uh, if we take the gradient of this, the gradient of this potential function, we end up with this vector field right here. So we want to show that the gradient of f ends up being uh, f as a vector field. All right, so all we need to do is just take the gradient of this right here. So let's see here, let's do the X derivative of this. So let's see here, well, we have a constant C, I'll still be there. And then we have the square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. So that's all of this stuff raised to the negative one half. So if we use the power rule here, we multiply by negative one half. So we have a negative and then a two. And then we have, oh, I always do that. And then we have this to the negative three halves now. And then what do we need to do now? So since we're taking an X derivative of this, we need to multiply by the X derivative of the inside. So that's gonna be two X. And lo and behold, these twos will cancel out here. So we end up with negative C X over X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared to the three halves. All right, now if we do the Y derivative, notice that this is symmetric with respect to X, Y, and Z. We can interchange any two of the variables that we want and we'll get out exactly the same function. 
Remember back in partial derivatives, remember when we have a symmetric function like that, then the derivatives will be symmetric as well. So since I got an X here with the X derivative, that means I'm gonna get negative CY for the Y derivative. And then this to the three halves. And then I have negative CZ. And then this to the three halves once again. All right, so this big mess is our gradient right here. And somehow we wanna show that this is the same thing as this. Well, I think we could probably see where the negative C comes from, right? Because we have a negative C constant in all of our components. So we can take the negative C out of it. All right, it's gonna take forever to write this again, unfortunately. So the, I should use my squiggle for this, oh well. Okay, so we got the negative C. I think we see where that comes from right here. Um, so what we wanna do now is we wanna see how we get the magnitude of R cubed. Well, remember R is this right here, right? So the magnitude of R is the square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. But then you see we have that, but then that's raised to the third power here. And we actually have this in all of these so we can factor it out. So that's where we're gonna get our magnitude of R cubed because we have the magnitude of R, but then it's raised to the third power right here. All right. And then this is now times just X, Y, and Z. But remember X, Y, and Z is just R. So there we go. We were able to show, and this is F right here, we were able to show that if we took the gradient of this potential right here, that we ended up with our vector field right here. So this is a conservative force. And if you guys remember back from physics, uh, gravity is a conservative force and the electrostatic force is conservative as well. And it's not a coincidence that they share those names uh, with these concepts right here. Um, some people were asking me about this. This was just to explain where this name came. This is an inverse square law, and it seems kind of weird because there's a cube there, but this is how we actually get the square into it. And this is an R hat. Where did the R on top come from? Like this one? This was just X, Y, and Z uh, right here. How did you assemble that last equation? Um, well, I factored out all of these, and all of these were absolute value of R, the magnitude of R, and then all of them are cubed here. So we have the ma uh, magnitude of R. Cubed. All right, now you might wonder, okay, we'll be we seeing some conservative vector fields where they have a potential that you could take the gradient of to get them. Uh, is every vector field like that? And the answer is no. It turns out that you can't find a potential function where if you take the gradient of it, it'll give you this. And this may look familiar. This looks kind of similar to that curl thing uh, that we had earlier. So we can't find a potential function like this, because let's think about it. Let's say we did have one, right? What would the potential function need to be to have an X derivative of negative Y? It would need to be negative X, Y, right? But if we do the Y derivative of this, we end up getting negative X. We don't get positive X. So it's not going to end up working here. So that's kind of the, the intuition here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how to detect these um, non-conservative vector fields in a little bit. Okay. So let's see here. Let's talk about the cross partial property of conservative vector fields. So let P, Q, and R be functions of, all of these are functions of X, Y, and Z. All of these are functions of X, Y, and Z, and they have continuous first partial derivatives. Now, remember, when we have continuous first partial derivatives, we could take the derivative uh, in any order that we want. So F of X, Y is the same thing as F of Y, X. All right, if the vector field with P, Q, and R in here is conservative, then we have the following relationships between these components right here. So the Y derivative of the X component is the same as the X derivative of the Y component. 
the z derivative of the y is the same thing as the y derivative of the z, and the, um, the x derivative of the z component is the same thing as the z derivative of the x component. So it, it, that's, that's where the term cross partial comes from. I like to think of it as like a derivative exchange program. So what we're doing is we have X right here and it's going to swap its variable with Q. So we send the Y over to the X component and we send the X over to the Y component. So we're simply flipping uh, which variable we do the, um, uh, which variable we do the derivative with here. So the vector field we are given is the gradient field of uh, the potential function. Uh, it is for conservative vector fields, that's right. Um, I'm assuming there's a proof for this. Yeah, the proof for this essentially, I'm not gonna show you the proof for this. Uh, the proof for this essentially boils down to the fact that we could do mixed partial derivatives in any order that we want. That's why they have uh, this right here. Now, let's say we only have a vector field um, with only two components. So this is like in the XY plane. Then we only need to satisfy the first one here. So this one, we would just say partial P partial Y is partial Q partial X. And that would be it. Okay. So the converse of this theorem is not always true. So, so what does that mean? It means that this cross partial property is really good at showing things aren't vector fields. So if you are a vector field, you satisfy this, but just because you satisfy this doesn't mean you're conservative. Uh, but if we wanna show something's not conservative, if it doesn't do this, then it won't be conservative either. So if you ever wanna show that something is not conservative, you simply need to show that these equations or one of these equations still doesn't hold. So let's go back to the field that we saw uh, wasn't conservative earlier. So I kind of gave like a kind of a heuristic argument for why that wouldn't work earlier. Let's, let's make it a little bit more rigorous. So this is going to be P and Q, well, since we only have X and Y, and it looks like P will be negative Y. Oh, sorry, thank you. So P will be negative Y and Q will be X. All right, so let's see if it satisfies this equation right here. And if it doesn't, it's not conservative. So we have partial P, partial Y. Now partial P, partial Y is negative one. But on the other hand, if we look at partial Q, partial X, that's going to be one. Well, last I checked, one is indeed not equal to negative one. So this means that F is not conservative. So what does that mean in general? It means that no matter how hard you look through your multivariable functions f, you won't be able to find one where you take its gradient and get this as a result. So this isn't the gradient of any function whatsoever. You can't take the gradient of something and get this right here. All right, so let's go over the logic one more time. So uh, if we don't satisfy these equations, then we are not conservative, because if we were conservative, then we would have satisfied all of them or only one in this case, since we only had two variables. Okay, now wouldn't it be nice if the theorem went the other way? Wouldn't it be nice if we satisfied these equations and then we knew it was going to be conservative? Well, it turns out if we strengthen the hypothesis of this just a little bit, then we can end up with the converse being true as well. So we just need to check these equations and then we know it is conservative right here. Okay, so let's take a look at this theorem. So this theorem is gonna be extremely similar to the previous one, except there's gonna be one little extra thing added. So let P, Q, and R have continuous first partial derivatives on an open, simply connected region. And I'll explain what that is in a second. The vector field P, Q, R is conservative if and only if, this means the logic goes both ways. So we have all of the same equations that we had on the previous page and they need to be satisfied on this um, open, simply connected region D. Okay, so, so first of all, what does this mean? Loosely speaking, this means that D has no poles. Okay, so what is that? I mean, so for example, if we have a region like this, that's not gonna work. But if we have a region that looks like this, 
then that's okay. And the 3D versions work as well. So for example, a bagel or a torus would not be simply connected, but a sphere would be simply connected. So we can't have something like this, but we need to be in something like this right here. Now, if our region is like this, then we can go backwards. We can just check these equations. And if these equations hold, then we know our vector field has a potential function out there. And one really nice fact is that R2 and R3 as the whole space are open and simply connected. So that's, that's the good news here is that usually the domains that we use the most often are going to be simply connected. So this works if we have D as our entire plane or our entire space. All right, so let's put this to the test here. Show that f of x, y, z equals three, one, two is conservative. All right, well, let's see. So this is my P, this is Q, and this is R. So we have partial P, partial Y. Well, we take the Y derivative of three right here, and we have zero. And then we do the X derivative of Q, and that also gives us zero here. All right, so we satisfy that one. But then the same thing is going to happen for these other two equations, right? Because we have all constants here, right? So any of these derivatives with respect to any variable is going to be zero right here. Uh, let's see, R, Y. We got that one. And then we have the Rx. So all of these are zero, so they're all satisfied. Now, was there anything special about three, one, two here? Anything special about those numbers? No, it's any constant vector field. Is conservative. Any constant field, I, should, I guess I should say over a simply connected region D. All right, so we need, we need to satisfy this here, right? Um, but if we satisfy that, then all of this is going to be conservative here. So constant vector fields, they're nice. All right. Let's look at one that's a little bit more complicated here. And this will also serve as a good example on how to actually find the potential functions once we verify that a field is conservative. Okay. So we're going to determine if f of x, y equals this in the x direction and this in the y direction is conservative. And if it is conservative, we wanna find its potential function. All right, now this only has components uh, x and y and all the variables are only x and y right here. So we're just going to have to verify that partial p partial y is partial q partial x right here. Remember this is p right here. And then this is Q right here. All right. I knew someone was going to talk about that. Yeah, there aren't any liberal vector fields uh, to my knowledge. Although that would be kind of an interesting definition of a non-conservative vector field would be a liberal vector field or something like that. Uh, anyways, let's go ahead and do this. Let's make sure these derivatives are the same. So partial P, partial Y. Um, if we do the Y derivative of this, we need to do a product. So I do the y derivative of my first piece and get x. I leave this alone. And then I leave this alone and do the y derivative of this. All right, so that's what we get for our y derivative right here. And then we have partial q, partial x. So we're doing the x derivative of this, which once again will um, just require a product rule. So we do the derivative of x squared and we have two x. Then we leave the x squared alone and we do the, uh, the x derivative of this, which will multiply things by a y. Okay, now these look a little bit different on the surface, but if we were to FOIL all of this out, this would give us x plus x squared y. So we see where the x squared y e to the x y comes from, okay? And then we have x times this plus another x times this. So if we FOIL everything out and recombine, we do end up getting exactly the same function right here. 
All right, so those are the same. So we do know that this is a conservative vector field, presuming that this is over, defined over all of R2 here. All right, so now what we need to do is we need to find its potential function. How do we do that? Well, let's think about how we find the vector field from the potential and then just go backwards. So to get from the potential to the vector field, what do we do? Well, we take F and we take its gradient, right? And what is the gradient here? It's just the X derivative of the X component and the Y derivative of the Y component. But what we wanna do is we wanna go from the vector field to vector feed, vector field to the potential function. So if we took derivatives for this, then what are we going to do here? So we did derivatives here. Here we're going to do integrals. So we took the x component of the, uh, the x derivative of the x component, the y derivative of the y component. Here we're going to do the x integral of the x component and then the y integral of the y component here. And those should end up giving us exactly the same thing right here, supposedly. And then we'll be able to combine them together here. All right, so let's see here. Um, I'm going to do, I'm gonna procrastinate and do the y integral of this right here. So supposedly the y integral of q, that will get us back to what our F is going to be right here. All right, so if I put this in, I have X squared E to the X, Y, D, Y. All right, so if I do the Y integral of this, I divide by my coefficient X here and I end up with X E to the X, Y. Now, the key part of this, and this is a little bit strange at first, is I did the y integral of this, right? While I'm doing the y integral of this, everything else is a constant, correct? So when I put my normal plus c here, I think I'll actually call it something else. I think I'll call it plus g. This could technically be a function of x, because while I was doing this integral, x is counted as constants. So this could include just normal constants like one or pi or whatever, but this could also be any function of x that, we, that, that could be out there. So that's what happens here because we did a y integral. And supposedly, this is going to be our little f of x, y. Because if we took the y derivative of this, then we would get back to our q right here. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the x derivative of f. Okay, so we have partial f, partial x. Let's see, if I do the x derivative of this, I have e to the xy plus xy, e to the xy, so that's the x derivative here. And then I do an x derivative of this, so that's going to be g prime of x right here. Now, when I do the x derivative of f right here, that should end up being this, right? Because the whole point of this was to get a function where if I took the x derivative and put it in the x component, I would get this. So this is supposedly going to be e to the xy plus xy, e to the xy, if I distribute this right here. So since these guys are equal, what does g prime have to be here? It's going to be zero, that's right. So if g prime of x is zero, what are the types of functions whose derivatives are constant? Or, oh, I just ruined it. <laughs> yeah, the, the types of functions whose derivatives of zero are constants. So g of x is some constant c. All right, so then that means we know what f is. f of x, y is x e to the x, y. Um, professor, could you please, uh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Plus c right here. This is our potential function. All right, let me, let, me, let me recap a little bit here because we've been doing, doing a bunch of jumping around um, between um, P, Q, and F. 
So here's the relationship between F and P and Q. So if we have F here and we take the X derivative, we should end up with P, which is one plus X Y P to the X Y. And meanwhile, if I take the Y derivative of F, I'm gonna end up with Q, which is X squared E to the X Y. Okay, so if I know that this F exists, which I do because we verified the derivatives up here, then in order to get F, what I could do is I could go backwards. So in order to undo say a Y derivative right here, what I can do is I can go back to F from Q by doing a Y integral. So I know what Q is and I know that F's going to be there because we verified it was gonna be there from this. So I do a Y derivative of Q. That gets me what F is. So that's, that's what I was doing right here. So I did a Y derivative of Q and I got F. The problem is, is that since we do a Y derivative, you can almost imagine this is like, like, a, like a partial integral. We only did the integral with respect to Y. So anything with X is a constant. So when we got our plus C, it was really a function of X because all the X's count as constants. Now we don't just want to leave an answer like this. There could be something meaningful hiding in this G of X. So what we do is we do the partial derivative here and we get to P because this is F, we do its X derivative and we get P. And so these guys needed to be the same. And that told me what my G prime was going to be here. Um, so one of the partials is integrated to test it against the original um, function. That's right. Absolutely right. Uh, Javier, wh wh which part is a little bit weird? So we, we take the, um, we're trying to find, um, after we check it, okay. So we can get F by integrating Q with respect to Y. All right, so we integrated Q with respect to Y because Q is this, and we get this right here. Now we wanna know what this G of X is, right? Because maybe there's a meaningful function here. Like maybe there's like an X cubed or a sine of X or E to the X, something that's like non-trivial inside here. So in order to do that, well, this has to do with X, right? So let's do the X derivative of both sides. So if I do the X derivative of F, and then the X derivative of these, which is this right here. Well, what's the X derivative of F? It's, it's P, it's P. It's something that we knew earlier right here. So P is this right here. So we compare these because they have to be the same. And that just means the G prime has to be zero. All right, either one of the partials can be integrated. That's right. Although I would not want to do the X integral of this because that would require me to use um, the tabular method for integration by parts. So I'd rather not do that one. Now, if this is kind of weird, don't worry. There's actually another way of doing this. So I'm gonna show you another way of doing this on the next problem. Determine if f of x, y, z is e to the x cosine of y minus e to the x sine of y and two is conservative. And if it is conservative, then finds potential. Value. So the same thing as last time, only this time we have three variables here. Okay, so let's go ahead and check this here. So we need to, to cross all of the variables and see if those derivatives will work. This is P, Q, and R. So partial P, partial Y. Let's see, the Y derivative of this is just going to be negative E to the X sine of Y. So we're doing the Y derivative here. And if we do the X derivative here, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x right here. So we actually get the same thing. So that's gonna work there. Um, let's see, oh yeah, I, sh I should probably summarize what we did with all this. So let me, let me step back to this one real quick so we can get a better picture. We knew what this was, right? These combined give us the vector field f. So this is the vector field f. First of all, we wanted to find out if this potential existed, because if it didn't, we'd just be spinning our wheels here and we wouldn't get anything sensible. But we found out it existed because these derivatives worked out. So we know this exists and we want to find it. So if, for example, in physics, you may want to find this because this will be the potential energy function of whatever your system is. So that's definitely a thing that you want to know about. So the way we were finding this was going through all of this right here. And then we, we managed to find out what the potential function is here. But I'm gonna provide you guys another way of doing it in this one. 
but let's verify these derivatives. So let's do partial P partial Z here. Uh, partial P partial Z, well, there aren't any Zs here, so that's zero. And if we do partial R partial X, well, that's also zero because there aren't any Xs in that one. There are no Xs in, sorry, there are no Xs in two right here. And then finally, the last set of equations we need to check is partial R partial Y, which is zero. Is that gonna be partial Q partial Z? Um, well, there aren't any Zs here, so yes. All right, so we've satisfied all three of these and presuming that this is over R3, which is the simply connected domain, then this is conservative. So this part here verifies that F is conservative. Okay, so that since F is conservative, that means that F, which is the potential function, exists. We want to verify that this exists first because we don't want to do a bunch of integrals and derivatives in vain to just not get anything sensible at the end. That's definitely not something we want to do here. Okay, so now that we know that F exists, let's try to find it. So remember the relationship between little f and big F as a vector is that the X derivative of F is P. The Y derivative of F is Q. And the Z derivative of F, since we have three variables now, is just two. Okay. So what I'm going to do this time, and at first the method is actually going to seem harder than it was before right here. Oh my God. We're out of time here, whoops. Okay, let me just explain what I'm going to do next. And then I'll, I'll, I'll post the completed notes to this. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to go backwards with all of them. So I'm going to do the X integral of this. I'm going to do the Y integral of this. And I'm going to do the Z integral of this. Okay, so let's do the X, X integral of this real fast. The X integral of this is E to the X cosine of Y. So it's just E to the X. But then this time, since we have an X here, right? What's going to be constant? Anything with a Y and Z in it. So we're gonna say this is plus G1 Y of Z. So the rest of the stuff could depend on Y and Z right here. How is this easier? You'll see in a second. Uh, we integrate Q with respect to Y. That's how we get Q back to F. I do the integral of this with respect to Y. I integrate sine and get negative cosine, which cancels with the negative there. And then this time, my constants could include x and z. So this is a random function of x and z. And then finally, with r, I do the z integral of two, and I just get, well, two z. And then this one could include x and y. Okay, so we get all three of these. All we need to do is put all the pieces together. So I see an e to the x cosine of y here. I want to include that. And I see a 2z here. I want to include that. And then we always put a constant here at the end. And that's it. That's all we have to do here. So we just integrate all three of them. We look for all of the pieces. So I see this piece appearing in both of these places. And I see a 2z right here. And then you sandwich them all together right here. Uh, why not two e to the x cosine of y? Because all of these individually are f. So we just need to make sure that each piece is represented. We're not adding these together. We're simply making sure that each one's represented. So the two z here is hiding in the g1 and g2, and the e to the x cosine of y is hiding in the g3 right here. There we go. So that's how we end up getting this potential function right here. So this often ends up being a lot quicker than the way on the previous page here. All right, we're definitely over time here. Sorry, I kept you guys a little long, um, but I will see you guys on Monday where we will review for the exam.